Hey everyone, you with Tom from Ludicrous Feed. Thank you so much for joining us today on Tesla and EV News Update Episode 7. Yes, Episode 7. I'm joined by my co-host Riz from Carlib. How are you, Riz? Yeah, going well, Tom. Um, it's uh, very exciting times with the recent news on the semi and um, thanks for everyone for giving us the feedback. Indeed, yeah. Thanks so much for your comments in uh, the last six episodes in the comments section. Really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, because of that, we'll keep going with episode seven and beyond. All right, let's start things off, as Riz said, with uh, news yesterday out of the US. The Tesla Semi has finally finally delivered its uh, to its first customers uh, five years after Elon Musk announced it on stage. And here's an article from Electric uh, covering that night very well indeed. Riz, what did you think of the event overall? Um, yeah, it was quite good. There's a bit of commentary going around that Tesla could have revealed more information, technical information about the semi. Um, I think it's still, you know, work in progress and they don't want to put all their cards out straight away. They're still testing it with, you know, Pepsi and a um, couple of others early customers as well as they'll be using it for their own um, sort of freight between factories and the rest to learn more, whether the drivetrain, the power system and everything else is as it should be before final specs are released, uh, but very exciting. Yeah, look, I agree. It's fair enough. They didn't reveal too much because their main customer base will be other businesses, not to us consumers as such. So, so it's fair that they're still testing and keeping some things under wrap. I did enjoy uh, the two liveries they displayed, the PepsiCo livery and also the Frito-Lay, the snack company livery as well. It looks fantastic. And uh, yeah, Elon Musk uh, was his usual self on stage. He looked a little bit distracted actually at stage as I thought uh, Dan Priestley, the head of the semi production, did very well to cover some of the uh, facts for him. But yeah, I wonder what well, he wasn't quite his effervescent self is. Yeah, it seemed um, like, you know, he's across many products. Semi is probably, you know, one of one of them, but I think his main passion sort of lies in the cyber trucks of the world. Um, so he's leaving that to the, you know, to the very experienced Tesla semi team to handle a lot of that stuff. But yeah, I, maybe a lot's going on at the moment. Yeah, definitely. So much, so many projects going on in the brain of his. Uh, but, you know, his, his team is what makes Tesla, the people behind Tesla that uh, make the awesome products. I'm glad they've got little special. They've got specialists for these products uh, in discrete pockets for the company. What I did love is uh, that they push the health agenda. Uh, this this sort of chart sums it all up. One percent of U.S. vehicles are semis, but they make up twenty percent of uh, vehicle emissions because of the diesel uh, engines. So it's good to see that they're saying, well, we need these trucks on the road to help help reduce emissions and particulate. Particular emissions that which make uh, health that uh, health of the citizens better and also reduce noise pollution as well on the roads. Yeah, I mean that's that's the main thing, right? The mission of the company is trying to ensure that we have uh, delivery of sustainable energy as well as making the world a better place when it comes to you know some of the climate change impacts that we've had due to emissions. Um, and it's somewhat because we can't see it. You know, in some parts of the world, the smog's so thick, they can see it and they know they need to change. Um, a lot of, you know, the US and even in Australia, many parts of it, you don't really see the smog as such, so you think everything's okay. Um, but, you know, that these numbers are pretty stark, like, you know, 1% of vehicles produce 20% of emissions. And generally within Australia, 20% of, uh, around 20% of emissions are generated by transport. So significant chunk. For sure, less diesel, more electric, better for all of us, indeed. I also enjoyed the uh, this sort of graphic they showed of the uh, powertrain, tri-motor powertrain, which I didn't realize is actually now in the Model S and Model X Plaid as well. Uh, so basically, there's one motor that runs on the highway to keep things going. And then if the truck needs more torque, then the other two motors kick in to help with the acceleration, uh, which is fantastic. And uh, they did show a video uh, on, the, on stage as well, showing this impressive uh, incline there it is, the semi overtaking a standard diesel truck right there. So, yeah, pretty pretty cool there. Um, at a 6% incline, uh, pulling 82,000 uh, pounds, just phenomenal stuff, really, which is about 35 tonnes, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, they did mention 500-mile range, and Elon did, uh, did confirm that it was on a single charge, so that's about 800 kilometres. And there's the, uh, there's the curve, or there's the degradation curve right there for the tr uh, truck. And you can see the gradients in the background as well. Pretty mm. impressive, Riz. Oh, 
just fantastic to see they're able to do that out of, you know, it goes to show the efficiency, which they spoke a little bit about. I just think that um, aerodynamically, what they've been able to achieve with this is fantastic. Um, I did read somewhere else earlier today that a diesel truck, um, on average, their efficiency is around five kilowatt hours per mile. Now, thinking about five kilowatt hours, we know electrical drivetrains are so efficient. Uh, five kilowatt hours out of a diesel engine, basically, you know, they're about, I think last time I checked, 20 to 25 percent efficient. Mm. So the fuel energy needed is around 25 kilowatt hours burning that to create five after all the drivetrain um, efficiencies that, you know, that all the diesel trucks have. Um, you, you know, you're burning a lot more and it's all going into our atmosphere um, where this is just so efficient. And working that out, two kilowatt hour per mile, they do 500 miles, it could potentially be one megawatt hour battery pack. Um, but there's other news today. I think Elon's one of the recent tweets sort of say the average is around 1.7 um, kilowatt hour per mile, uh, which makes it between 850 to 900 kilowatt hour battery pack. Yeah, I think that was most of the speculation around that mark for sure. I worked it out. Um, our Model 3s are about 0.3 kilowatt hour per mile efficiency. So just to give you some oh. idea there. And you're right, Riz, it's uh, electric powertrains are far more efficient. I think last time I read it was about 80 to 90% efficient, depending mm -hmm. on what you read. So far more efficient than the diesel powertrain, for sure. And uh, this truck started with a 97% state of charge in the Bay Area uh, around Vermont and it ended up in San Diego with a 4% charge. Yeah, pretty mm -hmm. incredible stuff, really. Um, and of course, the big news out of the night was that uh, it will also be uh, using a one megawatt charging charger for possibly the V4 Tesla superchargers at a thousand volt uh, architecture. So that's pretty impressive, Riz. Oh, it's, you know, it pushes things to the, to the next level when it comes to charging efficiencies. And even the cross section they showed of the cables mm. and the new liquid cooling technology that they're implementing to ensure the cables are as small as possible. Um, you know, and I think we made a comparison, um, well, last night when we were talking about uh, the semi around um, some of the charges that we see here in Australia, the tritium cables are so much thicker than what you, and they're harder to maneuver, they're heavier mm. than what you see at a Tesla supercharger. I mean, they're, you know, three times the diameter from what I remember. I haven't yep. checked it yet, but that goes to show, you know, Tesla's efficiencies. And if they can do the same thing and deliver that sort of power, using the new you know liquid cooled cables mm. um that's 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 awesome yeah liquid cool is definitely king we know that with uh you know ev battery packs and surely it makes sense also for cabling for uh charging as well just to give you a comparison uh the current version three superchargers are 250 kilowatts so one quarter of a one megawatt charger uh, and the fastest charger in australia is now 350 kilowatts thanks to the tritium uh, high-speed chargers they can actually charge at 920 volt at the moment. So slight increase there for the Tesla one megawatt charging technology. Uh, and the current V3 technology is uh, at 480 volts, I believe. So yeah, certainly double the last uh, iteration of uh, Tesla superchargers. Uh, there is a picture of the uh, drive cabin, I guess, uh, for the semi. Uh, a note there from our viewers last night who tuned into our live stream watch party was that having a center cockpit seat actually makes it easier to import the or export these overseas to other right-hand drive markets like ours. Uh, obviously, we need to change our ADRs if we want the semi to come into Australia, but makes it easier to uh, to produce these for a worldwide market. Oh, certainly. I mean, that's that's the thing with Tesla, right? They're looking at everything, how they can scale it quickly. Um, and in recent years, they've learned a lot as to what do the drivers want? Ultimately, there's, you know, one understated sort of topic around the whole presentation was the drivers, because this is literally their office. They're in there for eight to 10 hours a day. I know they have to take mandatory breaks and the rest, but this is their office. If this... But, if this looks like any conventional trucks, and I've been in a fair few of them in my previous roles, 
they they're bumpy there's so much vibration sitting in one climbing up one climbing down one ergonomically it puts a lot of strain on your body shifting gears i know a lot of them seem to be automatic but you have to control still control the, your gears um and that still puts you have to do a lot of thinking as elon said this is as easy as getting in it's like a model three yep. that's for not it's unheard of in the in the heavy transport industry yeah this will disrupt the uh the driving recruitment i guess if it's so easy to drive we might it might be more attractive to become a truck driver again. And I, I work in the health industry and I've, I've certainly seen a lot of patients who have had injuries from driving trucks, just chronic back pain, buttock pain, arm pain, you name it, because the trucks are so uncomfortable, as you said, Riz. So having a truck like this that's smooth, efficient, easy to drive will certainly uh, make life easier, a lot, a lot easier for drivers, for sure. And it's that vibration factor that we don't really think about, right? With most diesel trucks, you, either your engine's in front of you or it's under you. Yep. And that vibration that you're always sort of under, you may not feel it at, the, at that time, but, you know, sitting in it for eight hours, you'll definitely feel it afterwards and your body feels it. So it's, this is phenomenal, like amazing technology, this one. Yeah. And, and they showed the, the truck driver putting his coat behind him and the hooks behind the, the cabin there, which is cool. Uh, anyone who's ever driven on the highway in a diesel SUV will know the vibration you, you, you can tolerate driving those things. Imagine this thing, uh, you know, a diesel truck this big. But yeah, it's good to see uh, Elon and team have thought of that. How cool is that livery for Frito-Lay, that sort of yellowy red color? I love that. Oh, I wonder if it will change as it goes, goes on the road, right? You change of color <laughs> as you sort of see it. It's very, very cool. Yeah, I like it. I like it very much. Okay, so that's, um, that is the uh, uh, semi. And um, yeah, Electrex uh, c- criticisms there was uh, whether the price is around that $200,000 mark. That wasn't quite clear last night. Um, and one more thing to note is that uh, because of the electric powertrain, I think uh, they are allowed 2,000 uh, more extra pounds uh, as their uh, upper limit for payload, I think, or the, the truck's extra weight because of the electric powertrain. All right, moving on to uh, the next article uh, as a segue from the semis, of course, the news out of last night was that uh, the Cybertruck, yes, the Tesla Cybertruck is also going to get that one megawatt ultra fast charging tech as well. And I'm super excited about that, Riz. I, I think um, a couple of our audience are also very excited about this. We're just hoping that the orders open again in Australia. Mm-hmm. I mean, one megawatt charging. Some of the recent videos that I've sort of come across for the Rivian, that's one of the biggest complaints. Big battery, big truck, mm-hmm. charging speeds are just, you know, like a conventional Tesla. They're not, you know, they're sort of improving, but they're not there. This would be sort of next level. Being able to charge such a big truck in a quick, period of time on the road while you're working and the rest it's fantastic and yeah this one megawatt technology apparently will be in a lot more products as well yeah that's right hopefully it'll translate to uh, i guess the smaller vehicles in their fleet uh we've had you know we've had mr james downs from uh, eon charge of course he sort of highlighted the some of the difficulties in in putting or supplying power to these charging sites uh, it would be nice to see uh you know a I think Elon did mention too last night a uh, you know, support with big batteries around these fast charging sites to increase or improve reliability for the trucking industry. You can't have a charger that's down if they want to use this long-term electric powertrain. So, yeah, uh, good to see him thinking about, thinking about that as well. Um, now, the picture down here was uh, what Riz mentioned earlier about the liquid-cooled uh, cabling system that they need uh, for such a fast charging rate. Um, and yeah, there's the there's the amperage there, uh, ampacity they call it, charging ampacity uh, around these larger cables. So look at that sort of exponential improvement between V2, V3, and V4 in charging speeds. Oh yeah, a co- um, couple of months ago, I sort of on the driven covered um, Xpeng's 480 kilowatt charges mm-hmm. and the speed that they can deliver power into the vehicles. And only one of their cars, I think the G9, takes that at the moment, and that's only one variant of that car. So for Tesla to do this now, implement it in the Cybertruck, but then move on to other products, well, as, as well as the Semi, of course, um, this is a huge step change. Yeah, you see that cross-sectional area there. So yeah, there's liquid cooling around, you know, pretty much all the tubes now, uh, whereas in the V3s, the liquid cooled 
is just sort of you know on the periphery there so yeah mm -hmm. great to see the en engineering behind the improvements in tech so good uh yeah coming to superchargers next year so watch this space for version 4 amazing all right let's move on to other news now and uh mercedes we covered mercedes yesterday uh they are well, they launched the eqv electric people mover in australia and uh, their newest uh, vehicle in their lineup, the EQT, which is the electric minibus, now revealed with a 175 mile range to be introduced in late 2023. Oh, yeah, this, I think this would do quite well. I mean, the luxury people mover space is quite um, small in Australia anyway. Mm. Um, but seeing something like this, this sort of brings it back down to, you know, what um, some people in the luxury segment. Um, might be thinking for a family car instead of just a luxury airport transfer vehicle. So, yeah, good to see them launch new products. We're generally, you know, if it's sort of launching in Europe at the moment, we probably, if we're lucky, we'll see it by early 2024. Um, next year, Mercedes in Australia is launching the EQE mm. um, and the first deliveries of the EQE that we covered. Yep. Just thinking of our local... Um... A local situation here in Sydney, the um, the new airport out in Sydney's west, we built, uh, I'm not sure when the actual launch date will be or the opening date, but it's a, it's a long way from the Sydney CBD. We're talking like probably 70 odd kilometers. So, you know, I wouldn't mind sitting one of these uh, for that trip out to the airport one day. Um, so I think there will be a market uh, for sure in Sydney uh, with the airport being so far away. And and this is sort of, I think the side view reminds me of the Volkswagen Caddy a little bit. Um, you know, that's, yeah, that's sort of angle as well. Um, so it would be more affordable um, than, you know, what, what they have with the EQV. And we definitely need more um, EVs that can transfer people and, and for families as well. Yeah, that's, that's right. Big families too. So yeah, we welcome Mercedes with your electric uh, luxury people movers and minibuses. Next one is the uh, driving electric article, new Audi Q6 e-tron electric SUV spotted ahead of 2023 debut. Uh, Audi's latest electric SUV, Riz. Um, yeah, this is sort of their probably equivalent to the Q7, the larger SUV they have. So 2023 that's um i guess we'll see when the deliveries are but as that headline or sub the subheading says around porsche mccann in 2024 this would be on a very similar platform um the volkswagen and audi um well volkswagen group with audi under them are having some significant issues um with software um so that's one of the key challenges they have to resolve before they release these cars I know other people with ICE recently purchased Skoda, which also falls under their uh, Volkswagen group, are having problems with uh, infotainment software and software in general. And taking it back to the dealer for a car that's been on the road for less than a month, the dealer says we have no fix. Mm. So that's the main challenge is software and just shows the lead that Tesla has when it comes to software in the cars and how everything inter works in an integrated way. Yeah, that's right. Vehicles are certainly heading in that, uh, yeah, iPad on wheels uh, kind of, uh, you know, feeling. And they need to fix that pretty quickly because that's what uh, buyers expect now. They want things to just, just work, integrate with their mobile devices, all that kind of stuff that us Tesla owners have been used to over the last few years. So, well, look, we do welcome Audi uh, and their, you know, their SUV lineup. What I do like about some of their cars is uh, that sport back appearance there, that sort of half hatch look. I think that's quite nice uh, compared to that that sort of more square boxy SUV look. Yeah. And interestingly, <laughs> some of the recent vehicles from Havel also have that sport back look. So if they can electrify that uh, in the next, you know, one to two years and have them available in Australia, they would be on more of a affordable level compared to this, this, I mean, Q6, we're probably thinking, oh, uh, 170, 180,000 Australian dollars if it lands and when it lands here. Mm. So if we can get similar sort of vehicles, sport back look that people want, obviously, uh, looks quite sleek for around about 70 to $80,000 mark in an electric, electrified format, that would be awesome. 
Yeah, that would sell extremely well for sure. Well, let's move on to the next article, which is uh, Volkswagen ID3 uh, facelift due in spring 2023. This is quite a nifty looking uh, city hatchback. Oh, yeah, it looks really, really cool. I mean, um, here on Ludicrous Feed, we, we love hatchbacks. Yes, we, uh, we need more of them. We haven't even seen the first ID3. I think Cupra will be the first. Cupra Born will be the first sort of hatchback EV that we will see uh, from the Volkswagen Group in Australia. Cupra is part of Volkswagen as well. Um, but that interior looks pretty. I mean, we can sort of see where they've got the inspiration yes. for some of this stuff from. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, a lot of people have in the past, not not so much anymore, but have said, well, Tesla's interior is very minimalistic. Like, there's only one screen, there's nothing else. But look at this, like the ID3 is sort of heading that way now. There's still the screen behind the steering wheel, but there's no other buttons really apart from the center screen. And and, and that's, um, it, it's good to see they're heading down that path, but it's a little bit of a worry based on our last story, because if the software is not working, <laughs> then... We are in a bit of trouble. You need some sort of physical buttons as backups. Um, but anyway, I'm sure they'll knock that out by the time this thing comes out. Um, still cool looking car on the outside, cool looking on the inside. Hopefully they can make it happen. That's right. I think I think all vehicles need that control, alt, delete, uh, reboot system um, redundancy. I do like the head up display. That's something I do yeah. miss uh, driving Teslas. Uh, I know you can get aftermarket stuff, but... I quite like them in uh, the cars I've tested, like the Hyundai and the and the Kias. They've got the head-up display, which is very mm. cool. All right, and the final article for today is just a little snapshot of uh, Ford's sales, uh, sort of a sort of a picture and a barometer of what the how the U.S. auto industry is going as EV adoption climbs. Hmm, it's quite interesting to see. Like Ford is obviously their their ice business is they're sort of bread and butter at the moment, but I think this sort of, this article states that it's on the decline. Um, uh, like, but the electric vehicle sales are on the up. Mm. So, you know, down 7.8% uh, for their deliveries for the month in November. Uh, but the EV sales are up, which if, if they're the three main models, the Ford F-150 Lightning, which looks cool, uh, Mustang Marquee, we covered that yesterday, around 150,000 of them are on the road. Mm -hmm. And then the e-transit van. Um, and then in brackets, you've got the year-to-date delivery numbers. They, they're good numbers, but put things into perspective. Um, that's probably two days worth of production at Giga Shanghai. <laughs> so they're producing nearly 3,000 cars a day at Giga Shanghai to hit eighty to 90,000 production a month now after the expansion. So Ford has a goal of producing, I think, 600,000 EVs by 2024. If we extrapolate what's happening here, um, which, you know, let's just say 6,000 for the month at the moment, they might be producing eighty to 90,000 a year. That's a huge ramp up, you know, six folds in two years. Mm. So something has to something has to make sense, and hopefully they can get there. Yeah, it looks like they're going through what Tesla went through maybe three or four years ago, where uh, Elon said they're going through production hell. Looks like Ford might be needing to ramp up pretty quickly as well. Um, I mean, Ford sort of defines production processes, right, based on their history and all the rest of it. And if if one company can do it, it's them. But it, it's going to be a very, very interesting transition. I, I think they're one of the probably only legacy automakers that I think can make it happen. Mm. So let's just, let's just see. I think it, it's good to see they're transparent about their, you know, what they're producing every month, which is quite good. Yeah. It's, uh, I was actually quite surprised to see they're still the number two EV maker in the US. But as you said, Riz, uh, they're one of the few automakers, legacy automakers that can probably ramp up, of course, with the history. Uh, yeah, congratulations again to Ford. 150th thousandth Mustang Mark E this week. So that's that's a fairly significant uh, milestone there. So well done indeed. So yeah, look, we're we're supporting all EVs, of course, in this space. So hopefully Ford can uh, pick up its game and transition quickly as well. All right, everyone, that's it from Riz and myself on today's episode, episode seven of Tesla and EV News Update. As always, thank you, Riz, for your time. Thanks for all your uh, news articles, as always. 
any time, Tom. It's um, it's good to see the transition and, you know, just the breadth of what's going on globally. We sort of need that level of inspiration here in Australia to uh, see what we have to look forward to next year and beyond. Yeah, for sure. And I d certainly appreciate you uh, keeping us abreast of uh, what's at the cutting edge. And I'm sure our viewers do as well. All right, everyone, take care. And uh, we shall see you at episode eight uh, next time. As always, happy charging. <laughs>